We're all out and about. Hitting the wards. Have you got a question for me? With our ouch bleepers. Ready to answer your medical queries. That is a lovely question. Nothing to see here. Just three doctors waiting for their bleepers to go. Off. They've got on. <laughs> the first question is from Will. How are you, Will? Well, poorly. I'm in hospital. Oh, yeah. Keep up, Zand. So what was your question? If two people of the same leg length would have a race, why would one be faster? What's the diagnosis, Doc? Sounds to me like a case of, I want to know why two people with the same leg length might run at different speeds. Itis! Yeah. There are lots of things that determine how fast you run. And in fact, leg length isn't even that important. It's about muscle strength, how hard your heart can beat, whether it can get enough blood around you, and maybe most importantly, why you're running in the first place. If I told you to go for a run right now, you might not run very fast, but I tell you what, if Dr Chris walked in here and did his smelliest fart, we'd both be running as fast as we could. Yeah. Great. Question answered. What? You do the stinky fart, Zand. Quick ronks to the next question. It's from Javen, who has achondroplasia and is having treatment to make his bones grow. Javen! I hear you've got a question for me. Why do people snore? What's the diagnosis, Doc? That sounds like a case of, why do people snore? Itis. Well, I don't snore, but you should hear Chris. Why have you asked me that question? Because I snore. Do you really? <sighs> the tissues in the back of your throat, which are your tonsils, which are there, and your adenoids, which are there, relax. So when you take a deep breath in, the air rubs against those tissues and that's how the noise is generated. Well, you deserve a sticker for that. Thank you. No worries. You need to get a move on, Chris, because Emily wants to pick your brains. Why is your brain soft, Dr Chris? My brain's not soft. My brain is perfectly good, thank you. No, I mean everyone's brain soft. Oh, I see. Why is everyone's brain soft? Yes. <clears throat> What's the diagnosis, Doc? Sounds to me, Ebony, like you have a severe case of I want to know why your brain is soft, Dr Chris. No, in fact, I want to know why everyone's brain is soft-itis. <laughs> Got it in one, Chris. You're absolutely right. Brains are one of the softest organs in the body. And the reason I know that is partly because I'm a doctor, but also because I've eaten brain. <laughs> Not, not human brains, animal brains. Now, the reason your brain is soft is because it's surrounded by the bones of your skull, some of the strongest bones in the body, and then it's cushioned by a layer of cerebrospinal fluid that protects it. And that's why it doesn't need to be anything other than soft and squidgy. Did I answer your question? Yes, Dr Chris. Great. Well, you have earned yourself an Operation Ouch sticker to stick on your brain. That's all for today. <laughs> Clinic closed. All hospitals try and reduce stress, but this particular hospital calls on the services of a very special expert to do that. Someone with lots of blonde hair, bad breath and a wet nose. Meet Golden Retriever Nala. She's worked as a pet therapy dog for 14 years and is known at this hospital as Dr Dog. <coughs> Animal therapy dogs like Nala need to be calm, obedient and really intelligent. Not any old mutt can make the cut. Two of Nala's biggest fans are Spike and his sister Poppy. Spike has been in and out of hospital for most of his life. He and Nala have become good friends. What's your favourite bit of Nala to stroke? I've got two. Go for it. My, her ears and her tummy. And her tummy. How does it make you feel when you see Nala? Poppy, how do you feel? Because you come into hospital a lot to see your younger brother. Yeah, I think Nala helps you relax. Nala, do you feel happy when you see Spike? Yes! <laughs> Nala makes new friends every day. Harvey has just popped in for a checkup. While you've been with Nala, have you been agonising about your appointment? I've just been thinking about the dog, really. <laughs> Dogs are, like, really cuddly and they just look really cute. Once you've petted her, we ask everyone Spray their hands. Nala has a bottle of germ-busting gel attached to her collar. Do you know why that's important? You might get germs if you put your hand in your mouth. So you've got to wash your hands. That is exactly right. There's no doubt that this professional pooch can put a smile on your face, but can Nala really have a physical effect on a patient's health? Well, let's put Dr Dog to the test. 
To help me, here's Miracle, who's in hospital having kidney dialysis treatment. Can you explain to me how it all works? The machine can clean my blood. So the machine is taking the place of your kidneys, is that right? Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is, while you're having your dialysis, I want to measure your blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to bring in Nala the dog, mm -hmm. and we're going to see what happens to your blood pressure. A blood pressure test is a simple way to check if a patient is stressed. Being stressed out can lead to high blood pressure, okay. which means that your heart is under extra strain. It's a miracle. At the moment, your blood pressure is 116 over 67. Those numbers mean Miracle's blood pressure is already within the normal range. But let's see if Nala can make Miracle even more relaxed. After a few minutes of stroking our happy hound, we take Miracle's blood pressure again. So, Miracle, your, your blood pressure has gone from 116 over 67 to 105 over 59. So, although it's still within the normal range, her blood pressure has gone down, meaning Miracle is more relaxed and less stressed. The science is clear. Not only does Nala make people smile, she also physically improves a patient's health. For me, that is totally amazing that we can bring an animal in and just through affecting Miracle's mood, we can have a really big effect. Now, stress over a long time can be bad for your body, but dogs like Nala are amazing at relieving it. So every single person she's met today, including me, has had a little boost. I feel very relaxed. Thank you, Nala. So what I want Zan to do is stick the camera into his mouth and then using the flexible end, hook it up and look out of his nose from the back of his mouth. This is not an easy thing to do and we can only do this because we're doctors. The dangly bit at the back of the mouth, that's the uvula. Now we're right in the back of the oropharynx. So the camera's just back here now. Zan's gonna tilt it up. And wow, look at that. We are getting the most amazing view of the back of his turban. And it's very, very hard to find this view anywhere else. This is really an operation ouch first. We didn't even see this in medical school. So in order for your lungs to stay healthy, what they need is clean, warm, moist air. And it's the turbinates that make that happen. How would it affect your body if you didn't have any turbinates at all? Well, we're going to show you. Zand, I have just the thing to help us. A giant nose. Oh, well, won't you be angry? Who? The giant? Now, there's also a trachea or windpipe here, and then down at the bottom, a nice pair of lungs there. If you have a look inside, my nose is filled with gooey snot. You can see it here. And poking out inside it are the turbinates. And just like the ones in your nose, these are pretty hot at 37 degrees, thanks to these heating pads. My nose isn't looking quite as good. I've barely got any mucus, there are no heating pads, and I haven't got any turbinates at all. Because I'm really not sure that my nose is going to function as well as yours. Well, we'll find out in a minute. Remember, Zahn, our lungs need clean, warm, moist air. Are you ready, Zahn? I'm ready to the nose blowers. Using our nose blowers, we're going to see whose nostril can deliver the most warm, moist, and the cleanest air to their lung. Go! Chris's nose has turbulence, so the air passing through his nostril is coming into contact with more nasal tissue and snot than in mine. This means Chris's air will be nice and moist, but mine will be dry. This is a disaster. Our infrared camera shows different temperatures with different colours. The hottest areas are the bright yellow ones. So you can see that the turbinates in my nostril are making the air hotter than the air in Zahn's nostril. So far, Chris's nostril has delivered both warm and moist air, which is perfect for a healthy lung. But mine has cold, dry air, so my lung is at risk of infection. But now what happens if we make the air full of giant dirt for a giant nose? Great! You thought of everything. Three, two, one, go! Chris's snot-covered turbinates catch lots of the dirt in the air passing over them. But because I have no turbinates in my nostril, there's less snot. So lots of dirt is reaching my lung, making it filthy. Chris's lung is nice and clean. His nostril wins! So we've shown you an amazing TV first, an incredible close-up look at the back of your turbinates. We've also shown that your heated, mucus-covered, moisture-producing turbinates keep your lungs safe. 
Without them, the air reaching your lungs would be dirty, cold and dry, which wouldn't be good for your lungs at all. So, it's time to tidy up and it's your turn on the rotor, so I suggest that you start at this. I'm sorry, Chris, but I can't hear a word you're saying. But you're going to have to tidy up the lab. Bye! It's your turn. <laughs> Remember Tenny and her bleeding nose? Her bleeding nose what? Her bleeding nose? Yes, what does it know? You said her bleeding nose something. What is the something? What does it know? What? Her bleeding nose. Finish the sentence! Let's find out how she's getting on. Earlier, Tenny and her mum arrived in the emergency department with... A humongous pile of tissues. ..and one of her many nosebleeds. Tenny was skipping with her mates in the school playground when her nose began to bleed and it wouldn't stop. Ouch! This isn't unusual for Tenny. Here's Dr Joe Stone with a plan to stop the nosebleeds for good. Dr Joe starts by using a spray which is a local anaesthetic. It numbs Tenny's nose so she can't feel any pain. <laughs> but it doesn't taste too good. Then, Dr Joe gets a stick with a chemical on the end called silver nitrate to cauterise her nose. Is it like a bit of a fire thing, like a spark? No, not at all. Don't worry, Tenny, there's not a sparkler in sight. Cauterisation means to carefully burn and destroy unwanted tissue. The silver nitrate on the end of the stick softly burns the troublesome blood vessel, sealing it up and stopping it from ever bleeding again. It sounds drastic, but it's very gentle. And with the anaesthetic, Tenny doesn't feel a thing. You're all done. No, it was not that bad. She shouldn't pick it, blow it, try not to sneeze too much, and hopefully it should go back to normal within about five days. Hopefully my nose bleeds won't start again. Well, fingers crossed, that's done the trick. Bye! Bye! Bye. <laughs> What are you doing? You know that I've expressly forbidden you from burping in the lab. No, Chris. Today, I am allowed to burp because today's lab is all about burping. Burping is something we all do, no matter who you are. And there's even a medical name for it, eructation. Burping is a very important bodily function. All burps are made of gas that your body wants to get rid of. It might be because you've swallowed air, because you gobble your lunch too fast, like Zand, or it might be carbon dioxide from chemical reactions in your stomach, or from the bubbles in a fizzy drink like this. <coughs> now, the rumbling sound of a burp is caused when gas escapes through your esophagus or food pipe. Now, the internet says that the sound actually comes when it passes over a very important body part just here in your throat called the epiglottis. This stops food from going into your windpipe when you swallow. But we don't think that the internet is actually correct. So we want to find out where does the noise of a burp actually come from and what would happen if you didn't burp at all. Let's find out. To show you where a burp comes from, we're going to film an actual burp from the inside. Pardon you. Never in all of human history has anyone ever filmed a burp from the inside. Really? Yes, that really is true. We're going to use a special camera to look down my throat. But don't you go sticking anything down your throat. We can only do this because we're doctors. Away we go. So now we can see inside Zahn's mouth. And then as we go back, you can see the dangly bit at the back of Zahn's mouth, the uvula. And this little flap of tissue here is Zahn's epiglottis. Hello, Zahn's epiglottis. Ah. Uh -oh. Now, keep your eye on the opening of the esophagus. <coughs> and there it is, a burp! A world's first, a burp on camera. As the air burps out, the soft tissue at the top of the esophagus is flapping, while the epiglottis does nothing. So we have proven burping is not the epiglottis flapping, it's the soft tissues at the top of the esophagus. Take that, Internet. You're wrong. But we're not stopping there. Remember, burping is a perfectly natural body function, although it's not polite to burp loudly like Zand is doing in this experiment. But what would happen if you didn't burp at all? Well, Chris, put these on and I'll show you, because I am about to introduce you to a fearsome new machine. Meet Dr Zand's amazing eructation machines. Ta-da! 
Well, show me how it works. Here we have kitchen vinegar. We're going to take this and pour it through here. Now, in the model, this bit represents the back of your throat, and the food is going to flow down the esophagus, the food pipe, into our stomachs. These balloons contain bicarbonate of soda, which will react with the vinegar and produce gas, and we will get burping. So how does it work? Let me show you. The liquid goes down the throat into the esophagus. And this is what happens when you drink. Your esophagus fills up. We close that valve at the top, which is what happens when you swallow. And then we open this valve, the esophageal sphincter, and we let the food into the stomach. And then we can see it already, gas bubbling up, the chemicals in the food reacting with the chemicals in the stomach. You can feel a bit of rumbling. You can feel a burp coming. You relax. This valve at the top, which is the cricopharyngeus muscle, and... Ooh! <laughs> that is excellent. But you asked me what would happen if you couldn't burp, and now we're about to find out. So get your vinegar and pour it in the top. Now let the food into the stomach. Ooh, we can see the gas. Gas is coming out of the stomach, but it can't escape the closed valve at the top of the esophagus. If you can't burp, it means that none of the gas can escape upwards, and so it builds up in the stomach. You would be getting very uncomfortable right now if that was your real stomach. Zan, I'm going to add more blue vinegar. Chris, it wasn't designed to withstand this kind of pressure. More gas means more pressure. Here he goes. Oh, oh Zan. Oh, here we go. It's going to go. No! Ah! Wow. <laughs> that was amazing. Uh, no, Zard, are you hungry? Have you eaten lunch? I have eaten lunch, Chris, but there is always room for a little something more. Well, that is good, Zard, because I have a small treat for you. A treat? Well, what is it? This. A single butter bean. How is that a treat? Well, you said you only had room for something small. And anyway, this is a magic bean. A magic bean? <laughs> uh, yeah, da, 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 da. In order to get this bean, Zard, you have to take part in today's mind-bending experiment. This is a very simple game. There are three beans, one on each cup. When I say so, you're going to put those three beans into the other cup, OK? Ready? Three, two, one, go. Yes! So that took you four and a half seconds. OK. Four okay. Nice. Now, I want you to put on the glasses that you can see on the table. Now, do these look like normal glasses? No. No, they look a bit weird, don't they? These vision-shifting glasses make everything appear further to the left than it actually is. So let's try with my funky new specs. Are you ready? Three, two, one, go. Come on, Dr. Zahn. Come on. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Come on! Hurry, Zahn. Hurry, Zahn. And... Get it, get it, get it. Oh, that was... Did I do well? Ten seconds. Ten seconds. We repeat the experiment twice more. Come on, Zandi. And I complete it faster each time. Oh, four and a half seconds. He's now as quick with the glasses as he was without the glasses. Now let's try it again without the glasses. Go. Come on, Zan. So everything should be back to normal, right? Wrong! Oh, Zan, you're rubbish at this. What did I get? That took you seven seconds. So Zan was actually worse at the end without the glasses. Let's see how this lot get on. OK, they're nice and tight. Give me a high five. <laughs> Go! Go. Come on, let's go. Just like Zand, our volunteers have trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but get faster after a few goes. Getting better, 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 better. Oh, look yes. at that. With the glasses off, go! How will they do now? The class are still struggling. You were slower without the glasses. Who thinks they understand now what's happening? I think that the brain is trying to get used to a different way of looking at things, but if you take the glasses off, then it's kind of like you try and get in focus. Naomi is almost right. These glasses shift everything in Zahn's visual world a little bit to the left, and that means when he puts them on, his brain has to rewire itself so that this new world appears normal. But then, when he takes them off, he has to re-rewire his brain in order that his normal visual world appears normal once again. So this shows how quickly your brain adapts to changes around you. 